Thank you, Dove. Okay, so 688. Page 688. It's Perik. It's in Vayikra, Perik, chapter 23, Chavgimo, Pasuk Lamited, verse 39. Here's where we hear about, where the Torah instructs us about Sukkot. Okay? Ora Bechavod, Bivrit, Ach. Good. Now in English, starting on back on six eighty nine, verse thirty nine. But on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you gather in the crop of the land, you shall celebrate Hashem's festival for a seven-day period. The first day is a rest day, and the eighth day is a rest day. And we say the rest day, we mean Shabbaton. It's a Chag, it's a Yom Tov, right? So therefore, it would not be driving and all those, and all those things that go along. It is, it is a Yom Tov. You shall? You shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of a citron tree, the branches of a date of date palms, twigs of a plated tree, and brook willows, and you shall rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven day period. You shall celebrate it as a festival for Hashem, a seven day period in the year, an eternal decree for your generations. In the seventh month shall you celebrate it. You shall dwell in booths for a seven day period. Every native in Israel shall dwell in booths so that your generations will know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I took them from the land of Egypt. I am Shem, your God. Okay. Yes. Seven months, the beginning of the year. So. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, right? So, so, right, so we have a very strange thing. Rosh Hashanah, right, so in the secular calendar, Happy New Year is the first day of the first month of the new year. Jewish Happy New Year, Rosh Hashanah, is the first day of the seventh month, right? Everything is always a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing, right? So what's the idea of the first day of the seventh month? Right, so how can this? How can the new year be on the first day of the seventh month? Yeah, so we count. We, 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 actually, the first mitzvah that was given to the children of Israel collectively was that Nisan, the month of Nisan, the, the month of Pesach, the month of the Exodus, should be counted as the first month. Right. The reason being that whenever we say, "Oh, the third month, the fifth month, the ninth month, eleventh month, second month, twelfth month." We, we automatically think, oh, the second month from when? The seventh month from when? And that way we're all, our thoughts are always going back to Passover, to Yitziat Mitzrayim. How we use ever? Right? To the exodus from Egypt, right? Because that was the birth of our nation. Rosh Hashanah marks the birth of mankind, the creation of man. Right? The creation, or the sixth day, we say, of the creation of the world. So we have this duality that is built into our very counting of the passage of time. That it's the creation of man, mankind, and it's also the creation of the, of the nation of Israel, the forming of the nation of Israel, and the role that we are meant to play in this world. So that, that really is this, this duality that, that shouts out at us and, from the way that we count. And, and Joan, why is it such a, uh, 
What's so special about eating in the booth? All these small mm. details about Sukkot. Why is this so important? We're getting to that. Mm. So I, I put uh, Rachel here as my plant uh, in order to get started on, this, uh, on today's discussions. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's take a look at a few things over here. Right? Verse 40. You shall take for yourselves the fruit of a citron tree, the branches of date palms, that's the etrog, the lulav, twigs of a plated tree, that's the hadasim, brook willows, the aravot, and rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven-day period. So we take that and we are happy. We are rejoicing with our lulav, etrog, hadasim, and aravot. Right? It's the autumn, the collection of the... Okay, so it's, in general, it's a time of happiness. It's a time of gathering in as it began. When you gather in the crop of the land, right, so you're feeling good, right? What do these four species symbolize? So take a look on page 689, beneath the line there, where we have the different commentary, right? So uh, by verse 40, the bottom of 689, it's the bottom of the first column. The four, you the four shall, species. Yes. 40, you shall take yourselves on the first day the fruit. No, no. Come down, come down, come down. Oh, the first, right. And the bottom of the, the first column. The, 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 four the four species. Yes. The midrash finds many symbols in the common, uh, in the commandment of the four species. The two best known teach the importance of unity, unity of, of purpose within oneself, and unity of the Jewish people, as follows. The etro, right? It's mm -hmm. a etro, resembles the heart. The lua, the spine. The hadasim, mm -hmm. the eyes. And the arose, willow branches, mm -hmm. is the lips. Uh, by holding all four together, we symbolize the need for a person to utilize all his faculties in the service of God. Okay, so that's great. Let's, let's pause for a minute there. So we have the heart. Right? That is our passion. We have the lulav, the spine, which is our pride. Right? Stand straight. Right? Stand proudly. Right? We have our eyes, the aravot. Right? Our eyes are the portal to the world. We speak about this often. The idea of an eye in tov, of a good eye. Do I see the blessings around or do I see the, the, the hardships around? What am I taking in? And the lips, whereas the eyes are, is, is the portal of the world into me. My lips are the portal the of me <laughs> out to the world. Right? That's the entry point yeah. and the exit point. Right? So that's really, you know, how we deal, right? What we take in, right? And then what we, what we give out to the world, what we share to the world, right? The attitude, the teachings, the sense, the feeling, right? And all of this must be utilized in the service of God. We can look Beautiful. the other way too. Yes, Dove? The eyes are going out looking. And the mouth is getting things in. Eating? Yeah, the only thing the mouth is getting in is, 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 is the fuel for our body. I don't know. I, I don't well, know. That yeah. sustains us a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I'm not minimizing its importance, <laughs> right? Uh, but at the same time, lo ze kol adam. That's not what mankind is about. We're shooting rays right? out into the world from right? here. Because when, when, when Adam was created, the Targum, we mentioned a number of times, do, does not describe us as an eating creature. <laughs> it describes us as a speaking, a nefesh mamalala, yeah. in Aramaic, a, a, a speaking creature. Yeah. Yes, Cheryl? <clears throat> I'd like to see connections between things, so that's how I, I look at this. And um, so I always think of Pesach with the four sons. And I just think it symbolizes all different kinds of Jews getting together and just being united, even though oh, we aren't. Good, good. Continue. <laughs> yeah. Continue, please. The etro 
which has both a taste and a pleasant aroma, symbolizes one who possesses both scholarship and good deeds. The loa, the lua, a branch of the date palm whose fruit has taste but no aroma, symbolizes a scholar who is deficient in good deeds. Mm -hmm. The myrtle, which has no taste but does have an aroma, symbolizes a person who is deficient in Torah but possess good deeds. And the willow, which lacks both, symbolizes a person who has neither. The four species are held together because all sorts of people must be united in the community of Israel. Beautiful. Beautiful. Another, another symbolism that I like is, you know, we're talking about things that grow. Right? We've got an etrog bush outside over there. You know? And here in California, we've got loads of palm trees. You see the lulav sticking up for every single one of them. Right? Willows, myrtles, right? It's take things that are around, take things that are available, and rejoice before God. Serve God right, with what you have. Right? You know, it's available. It's here. Life offers us so much. Rejoice. Rejoice with that. And serve Hashem with what you have. Right? Now, it's interesting. Right? Ali, you asked about, you know, it's the seventh month. So seven is always significant. significant in that it is the holiness within the cycle. Eight is supernatural. Eight is going beyond the natural. Seven is the holiness within the cycle. So we have the seventh day of the week, of course, which is Shabbat, right? Brit Milah, is going beyond our physical is on the, the circumcision is on the eighth day, right? But we have, we have the seven days of the week. We have the seven months, seven years, excuse me, right? The seventh year is Shemitah, is the sabbatical year, right? Sukkot is seven days, and then the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, is going above and beyond. Pesach is seven days. And the se so we have the seventh, we have the seven days, we have the seven years, we have the seven, um, uh, what do you call it, a thousand years? Um, oh. Seven, right? So we have, the, according to the time of the world will exist in its present state for 6,000 years. We're now at 57, seven, eight. And then we go up to the seventh, Millennium, which will be a different sort of existence, Messiah, all these different things. So we have it in the days, we have it in the years, we have it in the millennium, and we also have it in the months. Because the seventh month is, is referred to as Yerach HaEitanim, the, the month of the powerful. You have Rosh Hashanah, you have Yom Kippur, you have Sukkot, you have Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah, right? For those who have to keep telling their bosses they have to keep missing work, it could wreak some havoc, depending on which days of the week things fall out. But it is a month that is replete, replete with these holidays. It is the holiness within the cycle. What's significant? Nine months a woman is pregnant before she, before she delivers. So nine, nine fingers... The nine should have been the whole is the, mir the, mo the, the most of the miracle, the, the most powerful miracle. So why ninth? Nine? Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that in New York, my son works in New York now, they close the, the whole month of September practically, they don't work, the company doesn't work. What's it's a religious company? No, it's not. It's a Gartner Consulting, the headquarters in San Francisco. Right. In but in New York... They yeah, have in New York, the public schools are offered Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. <laughs> Still? Yeah. They're closed? The public schools are closed yeah. on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Because Stony Brook did something really awful about that. I know because... Well, I'm talking about public school, and, and, and yeah, that's on universities. Uni and so. Yeah, SUNY. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. 
New York State or New York City? Um, mm -hmm. I know for sure New York City. I mean, yeah. they, they have days off on major holidays. I mean, yeah. Basuko Teshvu, right? And then verse 42, you shall dwell in booths for a seven day period. Every native in Israel shall dwell in booths. So into these Sukkot we go, right? And there's a special simcha, a special joy that we're meant to feel when we are in this Sukkah. What is this special joy that we feel in a sukkah? Is it the guests? Okay, so there are Lots illustrious guests mm -hmm. that come. In addition to the fine people that we invite, there also are the school of Ushpizin, and Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, I uh, get the exact order. Right, they are Yosef. They, right, we have these illustrious guests that come to us. Right, each specifically each night of Sukkot. But I, I imagine they're coming because we are in a state of simcha. We are hosting. Right, what is the special simcha of the Sukkah? And l l let me toss in that there is a teaching of the sages that. Sukkah is equal to all of the mitzvot. Somehow Sukkah envelops or represents, manifests all of the mitzvot. You have the feeling that you're in nature. <laughs> okay, you're in nature, but, but, but where do we go with that though? closer to heavens, maybe, because we're under the stars and we don't have roof, we don't have a barrier between okay. us. Okay, okay. Hashem. What were you saying, Cheryl? It's about uh, when um, Hashem took care of us and we were in the middle of, like, the wildness of, of the desert mm -hmm. and we didn't need anything. Oh, but we just got food according to the minute that we needed it. Nothing the amount and the minutes, good. And so here we are trying to connect again to remember that it hasn't changed really. That mm -hmm. Hashem takes care of us every moment. And okay. we're remembering that period. And all of the, uh, good, and all of the, the confidence that we put into our stuff right? Our homes, oh, yeah. right? You know, we're sort of like, you know, the three little pigs, illusion, right? Yeah. And we have our brick houses, yeah. and therefore we think that they can't huff and puff and blow, and, and blow the house down, right? But in fact, right, certainly as we've been seeing over the past month with what's going on in the world, you know, I was talking to someone that they had built in Puerto Rico because of the other hurricanes, they had built this hurricane-proof, concrete, whole, enforced, you know, house. You know, roof and everything. And along came Maria, and they said, and, and, and it was like a leaf being blown off of a tree. The whole house was destroyed. Right? It was, we, we put so much confidence in all that we have around us. And the sukkah is meant to bring us back to the point, like you said, of the Exodus, when we recognized, I don't say when we were fully dependent on God, because we're always fully dependent on God, but when we recognized there was no illusion, we recognized that there, but for the grace of God, go I. That was very, very clear to us. We recognized that on our own, right, as, as sophisticated and technologically advanced as, uh, as we are, right, in a moment, one gust of wind, and in a moment, I mean, you hear about Puerto Rico, it's going to take them four to six months to get electricity back. Right? As we, 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 you know, we're, we're just so advanced, we're so sophisticated, 
we have all these things and just and yet you know we are so so fickle we, we are so vulnerable right you know we could have uh, the, the slightest little prick of our finger right and uh, and, and bacteria gets in and that can end up ravaging our body right you know Lyme's disease right where does it come from a tick do you, do you know how small those ticks are right and in camp when now was running the camp you know so after overnights you know she, you know they, they would check the girls for you know how small the ticks are and that can cause something that, 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 that for the rest of a person's life, they're, they're out of sync. I, it's, it's, it's just as powerful as we are and as sophisticated as we are, that's how humbled we need to be because we are just so, so, so vulnerable and so, and so, and so tender, so fickle. So Sukkot certainly teaches us this, this vulnerability and this, this recognition. We leave our house, we leave our fortress, we leave all these things, and we recognize that we are simply there, but for the grace of God, am I. But what's the simcha? What's the happiness in that? What's the happiness there? That God loves us and He's there for us. Okay, I, 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 I think there can be a certain confidence that a person has that that's a constant that doesn't change. Right? Everything else, who knows what will be with it. But I'm there, the, the sukh is referred to, the schach, is referred to as the kanfei hashchina, literally the wings of God's presence. Right? Think of the sheltering wings. Right? You know, I was I was called this. You know, you know. Remember the old Allstate commercials, right? Allstate was an insurance company, Allstate, right? Yeah. And right, well, right. You're in good hands mm -hmm. with Allstate, right? That's what the the sukkah is. You're in good hands with Hashem. Will you always understand what happens? That we discuss often. No, no, no. you will not. It's such a right? But realize that you are in the loving embrace of God. And you don't need your stuff. Right? We all have stuff. I would say, what's, what's the rule of stuff? As much room as you have, that's how much stuff you will have, right? And we don't need all of that stuff, right? And there's a, cer there's a certain simcha, there's a certain release. If a person can integrate that, there's a certain release that, that, that comes with that. Now, sukkah, actually symbolizes life according to Judaism. We were in our permanent dwelling. We leave that permanent dwelling and we enter our sukkah, our dirat arai, our temporary dwelling. And then after the holiday, what do we do? we return to our permanent dwelling. Life, the sojourn of the soul. The soul was in the olam ha-nishamot, in the world of the souls. That is its permanent dwelling. That is its established place. And then it comes down into a temporary dwelling. That's what we see of one another. 
we, when we see another person, we're looking at the soul's temporary dwelling. And then the time comes, and it's time to return back to our home, back to from whence we have all come. So this sukkah is serving as this reminder that we are here in a temporary dwelling. And we have to rejoice in that temporary dwelling. This temporary dwelling is the dwelling that affords opportunities of growth, of self-actualization as a result of decisions because there are two sides over here. So it affords us these opportunities that don't exist, exist elsewhere. The Chavetz Chaim gives a beautiful, beautiful mashal, a beautiful parable. It tells a story of a person who had a wife, had children, and could not succeed financially. <coughs> Every business he tried would go down. He just couldn't do it. And he, he got, became so desperate, he decided to do something which was a bit, a bit wild. Because there was a place that was far away. It was like a three-month boat trip. But there, the streets were literally littered with precious stones, with diamonds. The problem is, it's a three-month journey there, and the boat won't return for another, for another number of years, and then he can come back. Maybe it was six months, I forget the exact story. He knows his wife's going to be devastated, but he sees no choice. He leaves her a note, takes off on that boat, gets there, and he can't believe his eyes. It's true. The streets literally have gems all around. And he starts picking them up, putting into his pockets, filling his bags. Right? Walks in, I was getting a little hungry after a while, walks into a grocery store, right? takes out these diamonds, puts it down on the counter to pay, keep the change. <laughs> and they say, uh, sir, you just put some stones on the, right? you need to pay. Well, how do you pay here? Oh, our currency is fish. Fish was a commodity over there. Okay, he's got to earn some fish. Goes out, starts working, and for some reason over there, he was able to earn. He was successful. And he starts earning fish, and lots of fish, and lots of fish, and he becomes a, quite a wealthy person there. Six months later, all excited, trying to travel back home with his newfound wealth and success. And now he knows his wife, his children, himself, family, everyone, they will be comfortable, wealthy, good to go for the rest of their lives. Very excited. Boards the boat, right, loads up. He has boxes and boxes and boxes, loads up, right, and starts the long three-month trip back home. His wife knows he's coming. She and the kids are at the port. They come there every day. They see in the distance, oh, that's, that's the boat. We can see it now. Right? Every day it's getting closer, getting closer, getting closer. Only the boat is about six hours away. Right, and they're all standing by the port, they're so excited. And suddenly, what's that smell? Hmm, something smells really awful. What's that smell? And the boat's getting closer, and people are starting to faint. They're tearing, they're uh, gasping. Some of them are whatever. Right, uh, right, right. Falling, and pulls up, right? And he came with a boat full of fish. Three months later, it's rotting. There's a stench. Right? He gets off the boat and he realizes. And he says, how did I forget? How did I get so caught up 
in the mindset of that island that I forgot what I came here for. And I brought back fish. And his wife says, do you, uh, do you have anything? And he reaches into his pocket and he sees, you know, he emptied out his pockets of all those stones that were worthless over there. But he sees, oh, I still have, uh, bottom, I got caught in the lint, the bottom of one of his pockets, there's a, there's a little diamond, right? And in his backpack, you know, got stuck in the bottom there when he emptied it all out, there was another little diamond. And he sees, wife says, says, oh, we're set. We're wealthy. Uh, he looks at that and he feels great. We have some, some source of wealth. But his heart is breaking thinking about what he had. The opportunity that he had and what he unloaded. That is the sukkah. Prophet Chaim says that is life. Our neshama left and comes to this world where there are diamonds all around. What are the diamonds all around? A bracha a chesed, a kind word, a word of Torah, a, 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 a nickel to tzedakah. All these diamonds all around, opportunities all around. That's why we made this trip. But we come here and we forget. And we get involved in, in fish. Right? We have to accumulate as much fish as we can. <laughs> Here's one fish. <laughs> Here's another fish. These are very sophisticated types of fish. Yeah. Right? We have all these fish, lots of fish. Oh, more fish. Wow. More and more fish. So much fish around here. We get all involved in all of the fish. And we forget what we came here for. The sukkah serves as the reminder. You leave your temporary dwelling, your permanent dwelling. You come into a temporary dwelling. Now, you need to have a table, you need to have chairs, you need to have food, you have guests, right? You know, but you don't need all that much. This is a temporary dwelling. So we need to treat it as such. One of my rabbis once said, it's like a person who's making Aliyah. They're moving to Israel. Right? And the flight they have has a stopover in France. So they're so excited with their trip to Israel. They've got to prepare for their trip to Israel. So where they spend all their time, they've got to learn the language. Got to learn the language, right? So they spend months and months and months learning French. <laughs> There's French Jews. <laughs> months and months and months learning French. Right? But that's a stopover. That's a stopover. Yeah, that, that too. That's a stopover. You've got to learn the language of where you're going to. So we have our sukkah. We have our stopover over here. But we spend too much time learning French, learning the language of our stopover. And we don't spend enough time learning the language of where we are ascending to, where we are making Aliyah to. So once again, the sukkah serves as our reminder. We left our permanent place, the olam and shamot, the world of the souls. We come down to this world. It's a temporary dwelling. Take care of your needs. Share what you have with others. Make it, make it nice. Hang some nice plastic fruit, right? You know, but keep it in perspective. It's a temporary dwelling. Right? How much are you going to spend on your, on, your, uh, on your sukkah decorations? Right? It's nice. Yeah. What gets hung up in the sukkah? The stuff that the kids made. That's what's meaningful. That's what's meaningful. We, we, we try to keep sukkah decorations from each of our kids from when they were uh, in Gan. You know, two or three-year-olds, right? The weather has taken its toll on some of them. You know, some of them are over 30 years old at this point. Right? The weather has taken its toll, right? But um, that's what's meaningful. That's what you put into your sukkah, right? Not, not, not the big expensive, you know, stuff that we spend our, our fish on, right? But the stuff that, that is meaning. That's the connection, right? And that's our sukkah. That's our simcha. That's our happiness. 
when we realize what, 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 what do we need? What do we need? We need the people around us. We need the, we need the necessities of life. And we need to utilize, to utilize our time over here. I just saw a very, very beautiful idea also. After that comes Shmini Atzeret. What is that? Shmini Atzeret is the last day. But it's not considered Sukkot anymore. It's not Sukkot anymore. We have seven days of Sukkot. Of Sukkot. We have a holiday the first day in Israel. We, here we have two days. Then we have Cholam Moed. And then Sukkot ends. We have a new holiday. Shmini Atzeret. Which we... Here, outside Israel, have a two-day holiday, Shmi Yatzeret, and also Simchat Torah. We celebrate the completion of the Torah, and we finish uh, Zot Bracha, the last parsha. We start again from the Yinning, Bereshit, right? But Shmi Yatzeret, we don't eat in the sukkah on Shmi Yatzeret. Some say eat in the sukkah without a blessing because it might be the seventh day of sukkah, but in Israel, where it's Shmi Yatzeret, there is no sukkah. Uh, no lul of an etrog. Sukkot is over. So once again, what is Shmini Atzeret? is meant, right? And Shmini Atzeret is, is, is a funny holiday, right? Pesach, we have our matzah, we have our seders, right? Shavuot is Matan Torah, right? The giving of the Torah, the Mount Sinai experience. And Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, we have all these props. We have the sukkah, we have the, the Dalit Minim, right? Interestingly enough, we have one lulav, we have one etrog, does it work out? We have two aravot, and we have three hadasim. Once again, back to seven, right? That's using the natural world and, and finding holiness in the world. Shmini Yatzeret, what's Shmini Yatzeret? That we say is just God says, stick around, right? It's, it's like when you have a lot of guests, right? And then everyone's leaving, you tell your closest friend, you tell your, your, you know, your brother, your sister, stay, stay around a little afterwards, right? Stick around afterwards, right? And there's a Hasidic custom at weddings that after the whole wedding, there's a bad khan, like, like a, uh, a joker, and they have just a, a, a small, just the media family stays on for a little bit of intimate time, right? Shmini Yatzeret is, we've been bringing all these sacrifices for all the nations of the world. God says, hey, you guys stick around. We'll have a nice little get-together. Nice little get-together. That's Shmini Yatzeret. Shmini Yatzeret is a reference to Olam Haba. Right? So it's one day. Why? Because there's no way to measure it. Right? So we recognize that after our seven days of Sukkot, after our seven days of this world, what comes next? Shmini Yatzeret. Right? The closeness that we'll have with God afterwards. Yatzeret is a congregation, right? Like, uh, it's like a gathering in. It's like a gathering in. And, and Shmini is eight. Yom Shmini, like the eighth day is at seven. Yeah. And that is when we go beyond this world. That, that represents Olam Haba. Now, there are those that say, oh, right? And this is fantastic. There are those that say, oh, right? Yeah. You're going to live. You're going to die, right? So therefore... Right? Either some people get very, very locked in, like, oh no, the end, you know, walking around with the sign, the end is coming, the end is near, repent, right? The end is, that, that, that's one extreme. The other extreme is eat, drink, celebrate for tomorrow we will die, right? So let's get this party started, right? Because time's running out, right? And Judaism says, well, let's make this meaningful. Let's make this real. Right? It's not let's party and, and imbibe in all, of our, in all of our different pleasures or whatever it is because who knows what will be afterwards. No. Let's make this time meaningful. Let's make it real. But it's not, oh no, we're going to die. It's not this, 
the somberness, what is the mitzvah during the seven days? Rejoice. rejoice. The mitzvah is to rejoice during the seven days. Do you drink something stronger than water? <laughs> I was listening to someone. As I walk, I listen to someone. Good? Daryl Wine. Oh, he's great. Absolutely love him. Daryl Wine is so, great. Um, he was having this, oh my God, I forgot. You should get his book. He has a book about his being a rabbi all, all the years. He calls it Vintage Wine. Isn't that good? The name of the book? Yeah, well, <clears throat> his name is Wine, W E I N. So he calls it Vintage Wine. Ah, vintage Wine. Yeah. He's a lawyer by education. Sorry? He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, and then he, yeah. I actually mentioned him on Rosh Hashanah. I mentioned him. I mentioned him. Not sure what. Just one, one of my speeches. One of, his, one of his lectures, I don't even remember which one, I just listened one after another, I don't remember. But he was saying how important it is to like your house, to like your surrounding, to love, to, to actually, to love it, to like what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the fact that we're beautifying our homes. Uh, yes, in pers- you know, keeping things balanced in perspective, yes. You should be happy with your home. You should walk in and feel good about it. Yeah. Right? You love you, right? People come over, you shouldn't, right? It shouldn't be uh, ostentatious. It shouldn't be gaudy. It shouldn't be showy. It should be nice. You should enjoy it. It should be, right? If you're not happy in your place, mm-hmm. then you're not going to be happy. A person mm-hmm. needs to have their, uh, yeah? Yeah, moderation. Everything is in moderation. Yes, yes. It's the balance. That's the, that's the, you know, that's the key, right? And you see that in, 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 every, in every aspect, whether it's the health, whether it's our emotions, whether it's our financial situation, right? It's maintaining that, that healthy balance that a person needs to have. The yeah. problem is it's, 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 not, it's kind of easy to feel that you're in loving hands of God when everything is fine. But you don't feel that you're in loving hands of God when tragedy. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, you know, uh, we discuss. Constant feeling mm-hmm. of loving hands of God. I mean, the people, everything is God's hands. I don't know. For me, it makes it kind of. Okay. So, so we discussed yesterday. Last night we had our uh, our Tehillim class, mm-hmm. and we started to do t- the Tehillim of Hallel. Right. Hallel is those. This prokim of thir- of one thirteen through one eighteen, right? Which we say on holidays. It's praise to God, thanking God. Hallelujah, Avde Hashem, right? Right, and we say Yehi Shem Hashem Varach Me'atav Yadolam. May the name of God be blessed from now and forever. Sounds like a beautiful sentiment. It must be all throughout Tanakh, right? Well, actually, the Aramaic for that is Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mavarach Li'olam Le'olmei Olmaya. Right? We say, we answer to a Kaddish. Right? May the name of God be blessed from now and for all eternity. Where is that found elsewhere in Tanakh? Nowhere else is it found in its entirety. But a smaller version is found somewhere. Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yehi Shem Hashem, Mavarach. God has given, God has taken, may the name of God be blessed. Where is that found? The eulogy, whatever, morning yes, we talking. quote it at funerals, <laughs> at eulogies. <laughs> Where is it a quote from? Eov, the book of Eov, Job. Now, he's a person who went through up and down, highs and lows, such a low that he hit, right? And who's the author? So that seems to be that seems to be the uh, the, uh, the the if you want to describe Hallelu of De Hashem, those who serve Hashem, Eov is the example. He's an Oved Hashem. He serves God, which means when things are good, he serves. When things are bad, he serves. Right? And I I, I mentioned. I apologize, Chai and I mentioned last night. Right? So Tehillim is written by David Amelech. David had his highs, and David had his incredible, incredible lows and hardships. 
And the Gemara tells a fantastic story, an amazing story, that when Nebuchadnezzar had built his big idol, everyone had to bow down to it. So there were three people, Hanan and Meshava Azaria, who went to Daniel, to Daniel, and they said, what should we do? And Daniel basically said, right, there's no guarantee that if you don't bow, and, if you, and whoever doesn't bow down, be thrown into a furnace. And Daniel said, there's no guarantee that if you don't bow down, right, and throw into the furnace, that you will live. And they decided, anyhow, that they would, now, they could have said, let me stay home. But they were afraid that if they would stay home, the word would be out that everyone bowed down, including all the Jews. So they specifically went, and they didn't bow down. And they were thrown into a furnace. That was the punishment that was stated. And they lived through it. And actually, there, was, there were three in the furnace, but there was a vision of a fourth one in the furnace. There was an angel there. Nebuchadnezzar saw them, them living. Everyone else, all the guards who were there to tend to the furnace, got burnt by the heat, and they remained alive. And he started to say shiri, he started to sing praises to God. Praises which would have put David HaMelech, King David's Tehillim, to, to, to shame. A Malach came and slapped him in the face. And he stopped. That's the Gemara. So the Kutzke Rebbe asks, why did the Malach slap him? Why did the Malach stop him? If he can say praises greater than David HaMelech, so be it. To what God did he make those 